excitement. There's refreshments there for you. We've got a lot of surprises. I don't know. This evening to celebrate another beer pig leaving the sty. Always exciting, um, especially since this year there's going to be a couple, which is really exciting for us. Not necessarily exciting that Steve's leaving. But knowing that there's kind of an anchor keeping them around, we're going to have Steve for a little bit, even after he graduates. Um, and after you hear a bit about what he's done, you'll see why that's useful for all of us here at Moss Landing. So again, very excited to be here. Mike Graham, thesis committee chair, uh, committee Tom and Colleen over there, thanks for everything. Families for driving, flying. I have no idea how you got here, but appreciate it and that you're up here in the front row. And everyone else, beer pigs for putting on, on the festivities. It's a lot of fun. Um, Steve's been here a little bit of time. He graduated Humboldt State. I kind of got a cohort of them. He was 2012 Humboldt State. And then he went over to uh, Mark Carr's lab for a couple years before he came here. He came here at a time when I actually got quite a bit. I got Angela, and I got Cody, and I got you all around the same time. Steve's the, the last of that triad there. Um, he came here fall of 14, I think is when you showed up. And talking to him, interviewing him, it became clear he's a tinkerer, tech-oriented, wanted to talk about modeling food webs and doing all this stuff I hate, by the way. Um, and he's like, oh, yeah, that's what I do really well. And I'm thinking, you know, he's coming to me when he should be going to Google, right? Uh, and then it turns out in the end, he ended up working for Google, which we'll talk about in a bit. But he's into tons of stuff, doing tons of stuff. And it was just fun accepting Steve, knowing that I was just going to get out of his way and let him do whatever he wanted. He got quite a bit of funding. He got Wave Awards, various ones. He got the Quilt Award, which is the Signe Lundstrom Memorial Scholarship, which is pretty cool. He got the last Packard grant, right? We had a lump sum of money for the Packard Foundation. He's been here long enough to be the last one who had gotten that. And most of you don't even know that funding was ever available. It was gone before you even got here. So that's great, the last Packard Award. Wordy. He's pre made presentations, obviously, of his work. WSN, uh, Marine, he's talked at Open House a lot. Steve's got a pretty good presence here in the Moss Landing community doing a whole bunch of stuff, and, and we've seen him around, like I said, forever. Um, he's worked in the library. He's worked IT. CHN Tech until he killed the machine. <laughs> then he fixed it using parts off eBay or wherever, and then he killed it again. Um, but that was enough to demonstrate to the director that we needed him to run the nutrient lab. And so now he's currently doing that, which is a great service to all of us. And again, I think fits well within Steve's personality and what he likes to do. He was a foundation employee for the Anthropocene Institute, which was really cool. Um, and he could talk to you more about that. He was also a foundation employee on our Google aquaculture program, which we're now actually allowed to talk about. And Steve was instrumental in that, um, especially in launching a lot of that when I was even out of the country. So that was great. He's worked for my seaweed farm, which has been fun, um, having him involved in that. And, you know, I, I don't want to say too many funny things because, I mean, Steve, he's a character. Whether it's putting on costumes or arranging costumes for bowling, Halloween parties, Lab Olympics. I mean, he's really part of the fabric here at Moss. And luckily for me, I've avoided a lot of those events. <laughs> um, just having him at our family Christmas party where he goes into my five-year-old's room and starts playing Legos, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, prior to Steve, one of the coolest things to ever come out on Moss Landing Marine Labs in terms of subtitle was from that fellow right there. That's Ross Clark, a previous beer pig, who was successful at deconstructing a kelp forest at scale. The, one of the first people to ever break down a kelp forest by removing it. And I've just got to say that's now surpassed by the first person in the world to ever construct a kelp forest at scale in a replicated fashion. I think that is an incredible thing for a master's student and really cool. So that's the way you're gonna live on in terms of your legend here at the lab. <laughs> and I wrote all over your paper, so I don't even have your title. But now I do want to introduce him. Let's get him talking and a little less of me. Um, so Steve's here to give his master's thesis defense on physical and biological consequences of giant kelp macrocystis Pyripa removals within a California kelp forest, Central, Central California kelp forest. Okay, go on, Steve. Thanks, Mike. All right, so you already heard the title. I won't do it again. <laughs> 
So first, to just give you a quick talk preview, um, I'm going to introduce Kelp Forest and give you a little bit of background. From there, there's going to be a part one and part two, both with questions, methods, and results. And then finally, a discussion and conclusions. So when I first get to results, don't check out. There's more. <laughs> All right, so for those of you who don't dive, you might know kelp kind of like this. Big floating mats along the coast, and they don't really look that impressive. You might occasionally see a bird standing on it, pecking at stuff. Uh, around here, you might see a sea otter wrapped up in it, or in this case, a tired diver taking a break. But if you got underneath that kelp, you would see an entirely different world full of life. And the kelp you see here is the giant kelp, Macrocystis pyrifera, my study species. And it grows by holding onto the sea floor with a hold fast, and using little gas bladders called nematocysts, it's able to elongate to the water's surface and create that canopy, looking very much like a terrestrial forest, which is why they're commonly called a kelp forest. And the giant kelp grows fast, crazy fast. Um, in fact, it has the fastest elongation rate of any autotroph on the planet, growing up to 50 centimeters a day, and the closest terrestrial analog is bamboo, which only grows at 30 centimeters a day. This makes kelp forest one of the most productive ecosystems in the world, and in terms of net primary production and grams of carbon per meter squared per year, um, you can see that the giant kelp actually outproduces tropical rainforests. Even though the standing crop is considerably lower, this is just due to that really fast growth rate. And just like trees within a forest, the giant kelp also acts as a foundation species. And a foundation species is an organism with a disproportionate effect on the rest of the associated community. And when it's removed, the community is dramatically altered. And so in this case, we're all very familiar with what happens with deforestation and its negative impacts. Or when a coral reef is bleached and turns into an underwater desert. And kelp, uh, kelp forests are no different as we see here in the case of deforestation by urchins, creating a barren. And when the giant kelp is removed, many of the associated uh, community disappear with it. And a common way to study the impact kelp has on the associated community is by conducting removal experiments. Here's just a handful. This is typically carried out by quantifying the response of macroorganisms before and after uh, kelp loss or removal. However, the direct pathways and interactions are less clear. And this is because the giant kelp provides multiple service to the community, such as energy and habitat. So the giant kelp provides energy by supplying food to primary consumers. Uh, in some cases here, like urchins, feed directly on the kelp. Um, but studies have shown that um, kelp mostly enters the food web by particulate organic matter, <clears throat> or POM. And particulate or, uh, particulates are, are sloughed off of the giant kelp or larger pieces break off, and then it breaks down into smaller pieces. And that's usually, POM's usually broken into its two main constituents, which is particulate organic carbon, which is necessary for energy, and it's the building block of carbon-based life, or particulate organic nitrogen, which is used for various cell functions, such as amino acid and protein synthesis. So researchers have modeled kelp forest food webs, and the best one out there is this one by Graham in 2004. <laughs> and as you can see, a few species or a few groups of species do feed directly on kelp. But you'll also notice that the phytodetritus pool feeds almost every single primary consumer. And what adds complication to this is phytoplankton and other macroalgae also feed into this phytodetritus pool, leading some to speculate if the food web would actually be that dramatically impacted by the loss of giant kelp. And separating out sources of phytodetritus have proven to be really challenging. So, <clears throat> for instance, um, attempts to separate phytoplankton from kelp particulates, uh, most notably by stable isotopes or by particulate generation, has left uh, kelp contributing somewhere between 0.2 and 70% to total <laughs> POM. So, it, <clears throat> somewhere in there. Um, and then. <laughs> And uh, Miller and Page in 2012 reviewed some of these isotope studies and said that they were biased because of the way that they were collecting phytoplankton samples and the wide range of delta-13 carbon that phytoplankton can have that overlap with kelp. So the true contribution of kelp and phytoplankton to the food web still remains largely unknown. So the giant kelp also provides habitat services. So you can think of this as like protection from predation, or reduced flow speeds, so 
watering or by surface area drag, water can actually be slowed down through the kelp bed and by producing shade. Um, and this shade has been shown to impact other autotrophs. But <clears throat> how shading impacts phytoplankton is unknown, again, complicating the giant kelp's uh, impact on total particulate organic matter in the system. So we know that when the giant kelp is removed, a bunch of species go with it. But is this because of a bottom-up trophic cascade, or do most organisms just like being around the structure of the habitat? And are um, other sources like phytoplankton and other macroalgae enough to actually pro to support the food web? So for my thesis, I wanted to work on uncoupling some of these physical from biological uh, impacts of the giant kelp. And the way that I thought to do that was by creating artificial kelp. So artificial kelp would keep the physical impacts but remove the biological impacts. And the artificial method has been used in other foundation species such as mangroves, seagrasses, and coral reefs to investigate habitat associations and ignore trophic linkages. So this leads me to my questions of part one. So can artificial kelp be deployed at scale? So I didn't know if anyone had ever done this before, so this was really just a proof of concept. Could I actually do it? Number two, does particulate organic matter differ through the water column among kelp, kelp clearings, and uh, artificial kelp treatments. So if I remove a chunk, uh, a spot of kelp, um, do I actually see that organic matter signal change? And three, what is the contribution of phytoplankton to palm in kelp forests? So instead of focusing on the kelp generating particulates, I decided to focus on the phytoplankton. And by doing that, I could also use it to answer question four, do kelp removals in increase phytoplankton density? So this is, is there a shading story with the giant kelp and phytoplankton? And then five, what impact do kelp removals have on water currents? So we know that the surface area drag can slow down currents, but what happens when you just remove a chunk in the middle of a bed? I'm not really sure. <laughs> Look familiar, John? <clears throat> John used that drill to drill in like 40 something eye bolts. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, the study site. Um, this is just south of the Monterey Bay Peninsula. And this is Stillwater Cove in Carmel Beach. And just for a frame of reference, this is the famous Pebble Beach Golf Resort right here um, that we had to travel through each time to launch our boat. And each oval here uh, represent one kelp bed that I used in my study. So using those kelp beds, I used a randomized block design where each bed got three treatments. One was a kelp removal, one was a kelp control where I just left it alone, and one was a, a plot where I took out the kelp and then replaced it with artificial kelp. And each of these plots were 10 meter diameters. So before I get into how I made artificial kelp, I just wanted to give you some really basic giant kelp uh, morphology here. The entire alga here is called the thallus. And then starting at the bottom, we have a conical holdfast, and then going from there, we have a vegetative frond, which is the entire thing here. And then each of those fronds are made up of a cylindrical stipe. And then off of that stipe, you have the little gas bladder nematocyst and then blades. So here's my kelp design. Looks identical. <coughs> <laughs> um, so the, the design came from a bunch of published literature on giant kelp morphometrics. And the main goals were to match the buoyancy per frond to make sure that it would actually stay upright in the water column. And then the surface area and blade density by frond length. And so you'll actually see that you get more blades and surface area um, the higher up the stipe you go. And so each blade was cut from a um, brown and green tarp uniformly by a hydraulic press. So I'd cut a couple hundred at a time. And then those would be zip tied to the stipe. And then the, uh, the stipe was made from one one centimeter diameter polypropylene line. That line would then be pulled through a plastic dish and then I'd fill it with cement. And so that was how to keep it upright while I was moving it around. And then I would use a, um, a, hard, whoops, a hard mesh plastic to fold into the conical holdfast and then I stuffed that with more polypropylene line as the, the holdfast. And so to calculate how many of these things should be in each plot, um, I did surveys in the same kelp beds the prior year. And what that equated was um, each plot would get three individuals with three fronds, five with eight fronds, two with 16, one with 28. So for each plot, there was 11 individuals and a total of 109 fronds. 
is a mess. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. So construction took the better part of a year. Total materials uh, included 10,000 feet of line, that's two and a half miles about, um, 500 pounds of cement, and over 13,000 blades were cut and attached by hand. And so this was a lot of volunteer work and a lot of bribing, said volunteers. Um, and then here's what they looked like in the field. Now each, each thallus here is uh, nine meters. So if you think about it, it would reach the high point of the ceiling in here. Animals loved it. You see like a lot of fish in it. <clears throat> there. Rockfish. <laughs> And then there's little young of year rockfish up in the canopy. And then there's snails in it. And then look, stupid kelp rockfish. <laughs> Sorry. I, I always call them stupid because they do like a little headstand thing in the kelp. And I don't know why they do that. But Dumbass. <laughs> All right. So for the biological side of the sampling, I went out on a modestly sized research vessel. <laughs> and I would go and sit over each plot and drop down four lengths of hose. Each hose increased in two and a half meters to the final bottom depth, which was seven and a half meters. Um, each of these hoses could be turned on and off individually to pump water up. And the, the water would then go into a underway data acquisition system or a UDAS. And the way that this thing works is you have your primary pump pulling from those hoses went through a two millimeter coarse filter, then through a secondary pump and a deep bubbler to get bubbles out of the, the sample water, and then it passed through a SCUFA, a transmissometer, and a thermosalinograph. I'll tell you what those things do. So first off, we have the SCUFA, which is a self-contained underwater fluorescence analyzer. So fluorescence is commonly used to measure primary production because primary productivity has chlorophyll A, and chlorophyll A naturally absorbs blue light and reflects back red, um, so that's fluorescing. So the way this thing works is water passes through this little detector, shines some blue light on it, and then it records how much red is being bounced back. The, uh, the transmissometer then measured turbidity, so essentially how much gunk was in the water, how cloudy is it. And then, the, um, and then this one did salinity and temperature. Now I use these, the data from these to really validate some of my conclusions but I'm not gonna show any data from these in the rest of the talk, so you can forget about these ones. <laughs> and then finally, the water was expelled out of these uh, sensors, and I would collect one liter of the water to take back to the lab to do um, particulate organic carbon, nitrogen, particle, and phytoplankton analysis. So for the physical side, I, I hung a acoustic Doppler current profiler, an ADCP, off of the boat, and it, hang, it hung one meter below this, the water surface. And the way this thing works, it bounces a little acoustic signal down, bounces back up, and then using a Doppler shift can tell you the velocity of the water. Um, I had it set to record at 0.7 meter depth bends, so for every 0.7 meters, I could get a current velocity. And the, and the overall prof, the, uh, current profiles were averages of one minute. <coughs> So I'll go ahead and tell you now that I removed hose five from all analysis, and this is just because um, due to really low tides and some bottom topography, sometimes that hose hit the bottom, so I just yanked it. So I redefined these as surface, mid, and bottom, and that's how I'll refer to them through the rest of the talk. Oh, there's our research vessel. <laughs> <clears throat> Told you it wasn't the scale, it's bigger, but. <laughs> um, so no, actually, I came out one day and this, this mega yacht was sitting right on our site and uh, we looked it up and you can rent this boat for only $500,000 a day. <laughs> All right, so here's my real boat. <clears throat> uh, so before I actually did any, um, uh, before I did the treatments at all, I went and sampled each plot just to get a baseline data. Uh, between once a week between uh, June 13th and July 14th in 2016. Then I created my disturbances and put in my treatments and then I allowed two weeks to just let that stabilize. And then again sampled each uh, plot once a week from August 25th to October 13th in 2016. Okay, so for the lab analysis for uh, particular organic carbon and nitrogen, I first filtered these on, uh, I took 
From that one liter, I filtered 400 milliliters onto a glass fiber filter, then dried it, and then combusted it on the um, elemental analyzer, rest in peace. Uh, <coughs> and that gave me um, total organic carbon and nitrogen. And then for the particulates and phytoplankton, I took from that one liter sample, I centrifuged 50 milliliters for 20 minutes, uh, uh, removed 45 milliliters of the supernatant with aspiration, um, then I took that concentration and fixed it with buffered glutaraldehyde, and then took one milliliter of that concentrate, put it on a Cedric Rafter slide, and took 20 images at 100 times magnification. Then I could take these images and put them through an image J particle analysis. Um, and then for, for phytoplankton, I know this, um, this method actually doesn't allow me to capture the really small guys, like pico and nanoplankton. Um, so I'm, all, I'm only going to focus on diatoms here, and diatoms do make up a majority of the, the phytoplankton biomass, so it's going to be a good proxy just for how phytoplankton are going to react in this. So here's what that looks like. Um, so here you have an unprocessed image, and then here's the processed image, and each image was cal uh, calibrated with a 45 micron microsphere. So that way the, the images, I mean the, um, the particles could actually be outlined, enumerated, and I could have a two-dimensional surface area calculated for every single particle. Then I would go through, and there was 8,000 images, <clears throat> I would go through and look at every single little thing. So like here's a diatom, so particle 43 is a diatom, and then separate that out in the data. But I still wanted to figure out how much carbon these things were, were putting into the system. So Minden Dewar in 2000 published this uh, formula where you can calculate picograms of organic carbon per diatom cell volume. But I didn't have cell volume, I had two-dimensional surface area, so a way that you can work around that is calculate the equi equivalent spherical diameter. So I could take my area, calculate a sp equivalent spherical diameter, and then use that to calculate the equivalent spherical volume. So now I have a, a standardized volume that I can then plug into this formula and then calculate the picograms of carbon per cell in my data. And now that I have all my, my particles in this equivalent spherical diameter, I can also now calculate the particle size distribution. This is just an example of one of the, the samples. Um, and the way that you calculate the particle size distribution is first you, um, you set size bins on your x-axis and then make a histogram of your particles, how many particles are fitting in that size class. And then you can uh, plot that data and then fit a line on it in a log-log scale. And the slope of this line represents the particle size distribution. So the way you can think about this is what it tells you is the proportion of small to large particles. So the steeper this line gets, the, the higher proportion of small particles you have to large particles. And then for currents, the ADCP gave me velocities in X and Y, which is north and east. And I didn't really care which way they were going. I just wanted to know the, the average speed. So using some, some uh, little geometry here, we can just calculate the overall magnitude uh, which would be speed. Part one. Okay, so if we first look at current speeds, so now I have uh, current speeds in centimeters per second here on the y-axis. On the x, we have depth, so I have my bottom, mid, and then surface, and then the treatments are color-coded or color -coded with blue being artificial, red being clearings, and green being the control kelp. And that'll actually be the same throughout the rest of the talk, so I won't say it again. And then these are the standard errors that I'm plotting. And so when I ran a two-way ANOVA on this, uh, comparing the mean speeds between depth treatments and treatment by depths, we find that there is a significant difference by treatment, uh, with a P being less than 0 0.05. And a post hoc Tukey test would show what we can see here is that the clearings actually were significantly faster than compared to the artificial and kelp beds. And just to make sure that this wasn't um, location bias, I didn't happen to just put these sites where it was faster, I, I plotted the before and after, so the dotted line here is when I implemented the treatment, and you can see that the current speeds um, actually are pretty tight, and then as soon as the, the treatments are implemented, all the red lines, which are the clearings, are significantly higher, and one weirdo artificial, which I'll talk about later. So now to look at the biological side, 
So now I have um, particulate organic carbon on the y-axis in micrograms per liter. Uh, we still have the, the x as the depth. And looking at the two-way ANOVA here, um, we see that there is a significant difference by treatment. This is where it gets weird. Uh, that the artificial kelp had higher organic carbon than kelp. <laughs> weird. And the clearings. Um, but I will point out something else too right now, um, that a pattern that you'll keep seeing, is that the, the kelp controls are pretty even across the, uh, the water column. Um, but you do start to see this deviation by treatment on the bottom. And that's just a reoccurring pattern that I wanted to draw your attention to. So now if we look at particulate organic nitrogen, uh, we still have that in micrograms per liter on the Y, still by depth. Um, we see that there is no significant difference between depth treatment or treatment by death. Death. Depth. <laughs> <coughs> depth. <coughs> but we do see that pattern kind of coming out again where um, the clearings and artificials are a little bit higher than the kelp on the bottom layer. So how much of that uh, organic carbon can be attributed to diatoms? So I had a lot of zeros in the data set, so I broke this up into a two-part analysis. So First off, I, did, I ran a chi-square on just the presence and absence data, um, comparing them against uh, depth and treatment, and there was no difference there. So then looking at just the, where diatoms were present, now I can run my two-way ANOVA on that, and we have diatoms in cells per liter on the Y and depth on the X again. And we, just by looking at the graph, you can see that we don't have the same pattern as we had for POC and PON. Um, and in fact, there is no difference by treatment or treatment by depth, but there is just by depth, and you can clearly see that the bottom layer had the highest amount of diatoms. So now to look and see if, that, if the diatom-derived carbon had a relationship to total organic carbon. I have total organic carbon on the, or particulate organic carbon on the Y, in micrograms per liter, and now we have the diatom-derived carbon in micrograms per liter, and we see that there really is no relationship. These points are just scattered, and in fact, if you regress this, um, you have a insignificant P, and an R squared of 0.05, meaning that only 5% of the, the variance can be explained by diatom carbon. And <clears throat> at most, the diatom-derived carbon really only accounted for um, up to 3% of the total POC. Now if we look at everything else, so I separated diatoms, now we can just look at all other particles. Um, and so now we have non-diatom particles and particles per liter on the Y, still by depth here. Um, we do see that pattern coming out again where the clearing and artificial are higher than kelp and kelp seems to be pretty even. Um, there is no significant difference here though um, between depth treatment or treatment by depth. Um, however, depth is pretty close, and that's just because of that really high variance we're having with the artificial and clearing. And now if we regress the, the I now have plotted the, the natural log of non-diatom particles and the natural log of POC and PON, and POC is in blue and PON is in red. <clears throat> and when we regress this, they are significant. Um, there is a significant relationship and with an R squared of 0.5, so that's pretty good. Um, so it seems to be that the non-diatom particulates really are driving the organic carbon and nitrogen in these kelp beds. Now to see if those particles are primary production, I can look at the, the fluorescence. So now I have the log of fluorescence in micrograms per liter on the X and POCPON again, um, and we see that there is a significant relationship. However, it's pretty weak. Uh, for organic carbon, it's 0.05, and for uh, PON, it's 0.2. Um, and it's actually, it makes sense that you'd have a tighter relationship with PON, um, organic nitrogen, and fluorescence because uh, chlorophyll fluoresces, and chlorophyll is made from proteins, and proteins are made from nitrogen. So it would kind of make sense that I would have a stronger relationship there. And so now just to classify these particles, how big are they? <clears throat> so just to refresh you, I'm talking about the slope of this line here. Um, that is the particle size distribution. And when we compare those slopes, um, and so we have the slopes here on the y-axis now, and we see that there is a significant difference by depth. Um, 
and a post hoc Tukey test shows that the bottom and surface depths are more similar than the mid, which is interesting, kind of. But I actually think the coolest part about this figure is that you see that the particle size distribution really ranges from about negative one to negative two. Um, and just for a point of reference, the particle size distribution of the open ocean is somewhere about negative three, negative four. So indicating that the open ocean has way more smaller particles than you would find in a kelp bed, which makes sense. I would expect there to be larger particles there. So part one takeaways, real quick. So when I remove kelp, currents speed up. Um, particles are large in giant kelp beds. That's kind of a no duh. Um, these particles tend to fluoresce, um, even though that there is a uh, somewhat weak relationship there. And the diatoms seem to have really no relationship to POC or PON at all. And then lastly, that particular organic matter is well mixed in giant kelp beds, and that's actually kind of weird. Um, and this pattern is disrupted by treatment at the bottom. And the, way, the reason I say this is weird is because the paradigm is that currents move into a kelp bed and the currents are slowed down and it allows particles to fall down. So I actually was expecting to see a higher amount of organic matter on the bottom. And that's not what I saw. Everything was really well mixed in a kelp bed. So that got me thinking, how are kelp beds so well mixed? Like, what's going on? And at this rate, it was now winter. All the storms were coming in. I couldn't get out in the field. So I figured I would just bring the kelp bed inside. So I made a 145th scale kelp forest with a scaled 10 meter clearing. This is the top view. Then I could stick this in our flume. Um, and I could, what the flume does is just pass water through. And then I could pump some dye down and then see where that dye flows and see if um, this would give me any indication of what's happening. And the result was really cool. So this is really close up, but you can see that in the clearing, all the dye stays on the bottom. And then as soon as you get into this little fake kelp bed part so on the bottom, you actually start to see that dye getting lifted. And if you look really closely in this fuzzy video, um, you'll see that it's actually traveling up the back side. So the flow is going this way, and then the dye is moving right up the back side of these things. And so that made me think maybe this is what's happening. Like maybe there's some sort of mixing happening in the kelp bed and, and what it looks like is turbulence. Like maybe um, the currents are hitting these uh, kelp and then causing some sort of turbulence. And what a turbul the way you would define turbulence is really it's just chaotic water flow. And uh, we can use what's called a Reynolds number to describe when turbulence may occur. And the way that you would calculate the Reynolds number, which is here, is the fluid density by the, um, multiplied by the fluid velocity, multiplied by the length of the diameter of the object that the fluid has to travel around over the viscosity of the fluid. And you can think of this as a, uh, a ratio of internal forces over the viscous forces. And um, <clears throat> as you increase uh, fluid velocity and the size of the object, the Reynolds number gets larger. So what happens here is, so for instance, here we have a top-down view of a cylinder or a stipe. Um, and you have a low RE of around five. The flow just travels right around and it just keeps going. But around 40, you start to have a little bit of a vortex in the, the downstream side. And somewhere between 40 and 300, you start to transition to turbulence. Um, and you'll see that this is just, these are getting bigger, gets a little bit more chaotic. And between 300 and 300,000, I mean, it goes forever. Um, you're turbulent. You have now turbulent wake. Um, but what you can see in this diagram is you see that the flow is actually smacking into the backside. So it makes a low pressure on the backside, and then uh, fluid can actually fill that and slam into the back. And so I thought maybe that's what's happening. Um, so here's what that looks like. You can actually see it kind of getting sucked in there and smashing in. And if you're at the bottom, there's really nowhere else to go but up, right? And so this got me thinking, maybe this is what's happening. Um, so I used my ADCP data to kind of calculate a Reynolds number using my, my velocity. But I had really slow velocities, right? The current speeds were two centimeters a second, which is really slow. And when I plugged it in, um, I was getting really low Reynolds numbers. And it just didn't make sense that it, there would be that much turbulence being generated. 
Um, but knowing that I have dove these sites, I know that the water is moving faster than that. Um, if, anyone, if anyone here dives, sometimes you're holding on for dear life, right? Like the surge is just sloshing you back and forth and you have to wedge yourself down. Um, but that's caused by surge, not by currents. And surge is caused by waves. So just to give you a quick rundown of waves, they travel in orbits and these orbits decrease in size with depth. And then as they get closer into shore, the orbits start to um, kind of get squished into an oval. And then eventually it's just a back and forth motion, which we call surge. And that can move actually really fast, uh, much faster than a current. So now this gets me to part two questions. So can waves in, in uh, giant kelp generate turbulence? And can, if that turbulence exists, can, is it capable of actually moving particles upward? So at this time, I was talking to Dr. Connolly about this, and um, basically the ADCP data was just insu you know, insufficient. It, um, it was averaging over a minute. It was really slow. It wasn't capable of getting waves. Um, and so he was just like, oh, I just happen to have this cool thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is an acoustic Doppler velocimeter, an ADV, and it works kind of the same way as the ADCP. Um, except for what it does is instead of measuring the entire water column, it focuses on one single point. And that one single point measurement is highly accurate and a really high sample rate. So a, a sample rate of 64 hertz, that's 64 samples per second. So that can actually allow me to um, capture wave orbits passing over and also um, allow me to possibly even capture some turbulent shedding. But I still needed to figure out a way to see if particles were actually getting uplifted. Um, and at that rate, I was talking, just going around trying to figure out what kind of detectors I could get. And I heard Matt Edwards down in San Diego had a bunch of scufas lying around. <clears throat> and so he let me borrow a couple of them. One of them died. Um, <laughs> I have a history with these things. Uh, so if we, remeasure, if we remember from part one, scufas measure uh, fluorescence, and so therefore I could hang these things through the water column, I could release some fluorescing dye, and then detect where through the water column that dye is moving. So here was kind of like my plan, is I would dive down right on the edge of a bed where waves were moving in, and I'd find a chunk of kelp, giant kelp, count the stipes, then I'd put these, the scufa array directly behind it, and that was just, um, the scufas were held on a line uh, with a distance of 1.5 meters, and then that line was just hooked to an anchor and a subtitle or a subsurface float just to keep it nice and taut, but I could still move it around. Then I'd put the ADV directly downstream of that to try to capture any you know, turbulent wake happening on the downstream side. And then I could release that die at the bottom, similar to like I did on the flume. So for the dye, I used three grams of 40% um, uranine powder mixed with 140 milliliters of seawater. So I'd pump this down from a boat, um, diving, my bubbles you know, actually carried dye, so I couldn't do it diving anymore. Uh, and then I would pump an additional 420 milliliters of seawater just to clear out the rest of the line. And the, uh, then I would allow 20 minutes for that dye to get sloshed around, and the scufas would record at um, one sample every two seconds. So the ocean naturally fluoresces, so I had to, to define a detection threshold. Um, so what I would do is put that scufa array in the water, let it sit for a few minutes without any dye, and then I would uh, get the mean fluorescence, and then I would add the uh, maximum deviation of a two-hour soak, where I just had it sitting in a kelp bed for two hours, and added that to that mean as the detection threshold for dye. Um, and then the ADV uh, just like the ADCP, put out velocity in X and Y, but now I really wanted to capture the, the, the maximum velocities, so I rotated the axis to the principal axis one and defined that as U. Okay, experiment two, back to the old stomping grounds. So this is Stillwater Cove again, Carmel State Beach, but now I have more sites over here because this is where the waves seem to be moving in, and I can kind of think of this as a... Um, uh, a gradient of wave exposure, so it's pretty strong here, gets a little less over here, and then I added a few really sheltered sites just to try to get as much wave variability as I could. And so what I did is I did five coupled in and out of a bed, so I would go and set this all up in a bed, 
run it for 20 minutes, then move it outside of a bed, run it for 20 minutes, and then I added five additional um, just inside uh, kelp beds. That's what it looked like when I was diving, but it's cool. Okay, so now if we just look at the presence and absence of dye, so now we have um, inside a kelp bed and outside of a kelp bed, we see that there really is no difference uh, with, the pot, with the bottom two detectors. Um, however, when you get up to the, the uppermost one, there's a significant difference, and in fact, outside of the kelp bed, it never reached the upper water. And if I turn that into dye duration now, instead of, um, instead of just presence and absence, and now we're only looking at inside the bed, I can run a two-way ANOVA and um, see if there's a difference in dye duration by stipes, by the standard deviation of, of U, so that's the velocity in meters per second, and the interaction term. And what we see is that there is a significant difference with the interaction term only for the upper water and the lower water. And here's what that looks like if you plot it. So we have the interaction term of number of stipes um, and U in meters per second on the X, and on the Y we have the die duration in seconds. And so the blue is the bottom detector, green is the upper detector, and red is the middle, so they're just scattered all over the place. But what we see is that there is a um, significant negative relationship at the bottom. So the dye is detected less, or not as long, um, with increasing stipes and velocity. And you have the exact opposite happening at the, at the upper water, where you have um, more dye duration detected uh, with increasing stipes and velocity. So this is kind of an indication of as you increase stipes and velocity, uh, you start to push the water away faster at the bottom, and you start to get more of it at the top. And if you think about stipes and velocity here, um, remember we can kind of use that to calculate a Reynolds number. So here's what that would look like. So we have the die duration in seconds on Y, and we have the Reynolds number on X. And <clears throat> we have it actually got pretty high Reynolds numbers all the way through. Um, the, the blue dots represent where dye did not get detected. This is only in the upper water now. And so we had two hits, where it, two times where it didn't reach the surface, and those happened to be the two lowest Reynolds numbers. Um, and it seems like somewhere around 2,500, uh, you start to get hits, and then somewhere around 15,000, it just skyrockets, and you're getting a lot of mixing. And so that's a, um, a good indication of turbulence. Now let's see if the ADV can actually show us any. And so the way I like to explain this is um, this is a spectra of the um, it's a spectra of the velocity data. And so the way you can think about this is on the y-axis you have uh, kinetic energy, and then on the x-axis you have frequency uh, in cycles per second. And for those of you who are more familiar with periods, um, like uh, surfers. Uh, these, these areas like here are uh, around 30 seconds, and around here uh, it's about three, and then down here is about one. And so each of these panels is one of those coupled inside and outside of a kelp bed. So green is inside the kelp bed, blue is outside. And what you can see in, in most of these, or all of them really, is that you have your big uh, wind waves rolling in, the highest energy, and then at some point, right around a period of three seconds, uh, this is where we would start to consider it to be turbulent, um, you start to see higher energies inside the kelp bed. And so that pattern remains pretty consistent. And the, one of the cool things is that this panel, where you have the, the highest divergence and the highest energy, um, this happens to be that same point from before here. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's pretty... Um, pretty conclusive, I think. All right, <laughs> bringing it all together. All right, so I'm just gonna re-go re through my original questions and try to put all this together. <clears throat> so can artificial kelp be deployed at scale? Yeah, um, but it's really costly and time consuming. Fouling was an issue. So when I say fouling, I mean like, kelp was growing out of it. <laughs>
And I think that's because uh, the stipe, uh, that I, the, the material for the stipe that I used was essentially fibrous rope. Um, and that allowed things to just grow in it, on it, all over it. And in fact, fouling was so bad at times, uh, some of the fronds would start to lose buoyancy. And then urchins would just start grabbing onto it because that's what they do. And so I would do a few maintenance dives where I'd go down and find urchins had pulled down all these fronds. And so I think in some cases that might be why that one artificial plot had higher uh, current speeds. Um, there was also a story of the subtitle class anchoring in it and getting it all tangled, so that might be why. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the canopy shade, I think, was insufficient. So um, I calculated the, the canopy, and so that's what it looks like from the surface. But you can see that there's a gap here, and so the kelp bed is, is right here. And I calculated it that way so it wouldn't get tangled up with the natural kelp nearby, but that did add in a lot of light. So I think the, the canopy shade was, was not great. Um, so knowing what I know now, how would I change this design? So I'd use a different building material. I think if you use some sort of tube instead of a rope, uh, it'd probably be a lot better um, and keep that fouling down. The fouling on the blades wasn't so bad. It was really just like the rope. Um, I would do this bigger in an isolation for habitat association. So if you really wanted to use artificial kelp to um, check out habitat associations, uh, I think you would need to do this away from a kelp bed so you don't have any organic carbon flooding into the system. And then at that rate, you can make uh, your canopy as large as you want and you don't have to worry about getting tangled in anything. So my question two is how does uh, particulate organic matter differ among kelp, kelp clearings, and artificial kelp? Uh, well, first off, um, that particulate organic matter within giant kelp beds uh, seems to be really well mixed. And I'm, I'm hypothesizing that waves facilitate mixing via turbulence. And uh, total, total organic matter was not different among clearings um, around, or, I'm sorry, between clearings and, tr and uh, the control kelp treatments. Um, and so really when you remove kelp, you don't have a total change of organic carbon or nitrogen. However, you do start to see a, um, uh, the, uh, the particle distribution through the water column can start to change. And so here's uh, what I think is happening, like a little model. And I think waves are rolling in. You have these wave orbits. They smash into kelp. They cause some turbulence. And they're able to either lift particles or at least maybe make it harder for particles to fall down. <coughs> But I think if you moved further into an area where there was no kelp, um, that turbulence uh, could dissipate and then eventually particulates could fall. And then you would start to, to actually see a higher amount of organic material on the bottom where there is no kelp. And so uh, Miller et al. in 2015, so right around the same time I was thinking of this stuff, they published this paper, uh, Trophic versus Structural Effects of a Marine Foundation Species Giant Kelp. Sounds pretty similar. Um, and what they did is they did a, a 40 by 40 meter clearing, and they found no, gut, no difference in gut isotopes of benthic invertebrates. So um, they had benthic invertebrates in and out, and then basically said that their diet didn't change at all when you remove giant kelp. But they focused on really large fragments, so they collected it via scuba. So these had to be big enough pieces to actually like catch. Um, <clears throat> and their conclusion was the modification of physical habitat rather than the nutritional subsidy by giant kelp detritus likely, likely accounts for increased abund abundance in sessile invertebrates within giant kelp forests. So basically they concluded that um, it's all a structure effect, that that's why you have more invertebrates in a kelp bed. And I kind of agree. I do agree um, to the fact that the structure is probably the, the main driving point, but uh, if there was a kelp bed nearby, and I apply my mixing model, you actually might expect to see a higher amount of, of detritus accumulating within that clearing. And so particles are large, but have a weak, a, a weak but significant relationship with fluorescence. So here's just like, uh, this is about like a 200 micron chunk, and it's clearly a multicellular piece, but that's what a lot of my um, uh, particles look like. And the artificial kelp had higher organic matter. So that was weird. Uh, that was not expected. Um, and I think that was just due to that uh, high amount of fouling. And um, I, I, I essentially put 
two and a half miles of new substrate for things to grow on. So for question two, what would I do differently? I'd find more sheltered sites, sites to check the difference in vertical palm distribution. So if I could get to an area where there was really no wave action um, and see if you still see that, that, well, that mixing, or do things actually start to accumulate on the bottom? Um, and then test waves through kelp beds. So when I did my dye releasing experiments, I really only focused on the edge of a bed because I wanted to see the maximum effect. But uh, I imagine if you got really into a really large bed, perhaps those waves do get diffracted enough and um, may not have that, that same uh, energy. And then larger clearings. So for instance, the Miller all group did the 40 by 40 and saw no difference in their diet. So I, I would be curious to actually test um, the organic matter in a clearing that large and see um, if you still get enough particles from a nearby bed. Um, what's the contribution of phytoplankton to organic carbon in kelp beds? So the diatom cells, so this is just the standing stock, uh, accounted for less than 3% of total POC. So that seems really low, but if you take growth rates into consideration, so we saw earlier from Reed et al. in 2008, uh, the giant kelp's net primary production is about 1.8 uh, to 3.5 grams of carbon per meter squared per day. And if I use the, the diatom data that I collected um, and assumed a doubling um, per day, uh, we'd have somewhere between 0.06 and 0.76 grams of carbon per meter squared per day. Um, and if you, uh, if you assumed a two-source mixing model, so now we're only giant kelp and only phytoplankton exist, phytoplankton or diatoms would be about 20% of organic carbon. So does kelp shade reduce phytoplankton density? I'm gonna call this one undetermined. Um, the treatments had no impact on diatom density, um, but I think I missed the benthic diatoms. Um, and I think that's because I used the hose to just slurp water off the bottom, and it's probably not strong enough to actually lift off benthic diatoms. So I think I may have missed those. And the currents through all of these beds, and these are relatively small beds, but the currents never really got below two centimeters per second. And if you look at the size of the plots and the size of the beds, actually the currents would just move pelagic diatoms through the system way too fast. So even if they were doubling per day, um, I calculated that the currents would move phytoplankton through the entire bed within like four hours. So I really don't think a shading effect would have happened. Um, however, uh, it's likely that there is a shading effect on the benthic diatoms. So what would I change for the phytoplankton side of this is measure phytoplankton in and out of bed. So I didn't really have the difference of what was happening in the bed compared to outside of the bed. Um, put down some settlement plates so you can actually just let the benthic guys settle and then take those up and, and get a really good cell count. And then more rigorous cell counting in general because I had a lot of zeros in the data set, so that usually means I undersampled, even though I took 8,000 images. <clears throat> more interns. Um, so, so it's probably, you know, I either needed to make a higher concentration or I needed more images to be taken. And then what impact do kelp removals have on the water currents? So we saw that when you remove kelp, the, kelp, the currents speed up. Even though this is in the middle of a bed, and this is kind of funky, um, how does water, once it's already slowed down in a kelp bed, how does it speed back up in the middle? And so there's two main drivers of currents, and that's wind and density gradients. And so I found some, um, some buoy data for wind and plugged it into um, uh, some formulas to try to calculate how much wind stress is actually being applied to a 10 meter plot. And I could really only account for about half of the acceleration that I observed. Um, so what's likely happening is a combination of density and wind. Uh, and so if you think about it this way, so we have the current speeds moving through, uh, red represents fast and blue is slow. Uh, if you look at the, the, the forces acting on the water as it's entering the bed, you have force of density, force of wind, and then you have the force of bottom friction working against it. And at some point, you're gonna reach an equilibrium where the currents are no longer accelerating, they're just gonna move at a constant rate. Then you hit kelp, now you have the force of drag working against it, the current could slow down a little bit, but as soon as you're through it, these forces still exist. So in theory, the, the water could just accelerate back up 
until it reaches a, another slowdown point. So here's my main conclusions, um, is that the removal of giant kelp on smaller scales near a kelp source are really just investigations into the loss of the physical structure apart from direct grazers. So when we remove kelp, the POC didn't really change, so I don't really think that there's a food story there unless, um, except for uh, if you're feeding directly on the kelp. And the loss of kelp structure impacts current speeds and turbulent shedding that can alter particle distribution through the water column. And diatoms don't appear to be driving POC or PON, and other particles in kelp beds are larger than the open ocean, so probably a multicellular organism is dropping off these large particles, um, and they drive POC and PON. And if currents are present, pelagic uh, phytoplankton likely pass through smaller kelp beds unaffected by shade. However, benthic diatoms might be more impacted by shade within uh, kelp beds, but remains to be seen. So I gotta, I gotta thank a bunch of people though. <laughs> so first off, this is my dream team. Yeah. So first off, Mike Graham, my advisor, he's uh, um, <laughs> he pretty much knew exactly how to get me going. Like, when I first got here, uh, my first thesis idea was to transplant an entire kelp forest. <laughs> and he bet me I couldn't do it. <laughs> and if you know me at all, that's the perfect way to get me to work really hard. <laughs> and so I, I won the first bet. I actually did transplant giant kelp for a while, and then we doubled down and I lost. But, <clears throat> um, yeah, and... And he's always been really supportive, um, and he's got a lot of stuff in his head. So I feel like if you ask him the right question, he can almost always point you in the right direction. And then Colleen, who is my, my micro person, who <laughs> really got me to wrap my head around the small parts, you know, the phytoplankton and particles. And that was all uh, new stuff to me and was always available for my sanity checks, which was nice. And then Tom. <laughs> Tom, the way I always describe you to people is that you took me from the Stone Age and put me in the Space Age. <laughs> because when I first started trying to measure currents, I was literally diving down and setting up like a like transect square and then releasing water balloons and watching them <laughs> and watching where they would go. And so we went from that to like, you know, measuring wave orbital velocities. You know, so <clears throat> and then taught me Python on top of that. So yeah, that was a leap forward. And then, I don't know if Dr. <laughs> I don't know if Dr. Harvey's here, but, <clears throat> but Mike and Jim for teaching the scientific methods class. Uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is Dr. Harvey, you know. Um, this is a really cool class. Um, for those of you who haven't taken it, uh, you basically get to like go through your own work with a fine tooth comb and figure out what your stats actually are telling you. Um, and it's super valuable. So if you get a chance, take that class. So then I have my ride or die crew. So first off. So Lindsay Cooper, my first week here, she just came over to me and said, we're going to be best friends. <laughs> I, I'm not even sure if I knew her name, but I was like, okay. And, and we, we have, we've become best friends. Um, and she was with me through every single thing that I did, um, ride or die. And then Cody, uh, you know, who, who I, you know, he was great. Like, he always was able to go out with me. Um, and... I made him re-anchor this boat so many times. I felt so bad, because I would try to anchor away from my plots and then like drift in, and it's like, you drift off, and it's like, nope, pull it in, do it again. Um, but he, he uh, famously would call himself two boats strong, so he didn't mind. And then uh, uh, Captain Stefan and Philip Erickson. So Phil here, um, I met at, at UCSC and we did all of our dive classes together and did Pisco and stuff. Um, and so he actually went diving with me a lot to get a lot of my stuff going. 
Um, and then he went off to Sweden to go get his own master's and then still finished before me. <coughs> and then Stefan, who was just always there, like whenever I needed an extra hand, he always came in and he was always super funny. Like, if you were having a bad day, just take this guy in the field. This is what he looks like. <laughs> Not <anymore. laughs> And of course, the ever, um, the ever fashionable beer pigs. Uh, they're always there to, to bounce ideas off of and tell you when you're doing something stupid or really cool. And then I am now gonna get to my enablers. So, so people from Small Boats, JD, Brian, the rest of the staff, uh, Dive Ops, Diana Steller, the shop guys. I mean, it's just crazy that like, while I've been here, I could just go check out a truck and then just go get a boat and then go diving for the, you know, just with very little notice. And the, the fact that I always knew that those resources were there and working, I mean, that's great. Um, and the, and the, the whole staff, really. And then uh, Jason Allars, who really helped me put together that UDAS, and then Matt Edwards for letting me borrow four of his scufas, even though he only got three back. <laughs> and then my, my family for always being supportive, even though I've ignored them for the last 10 years while I've been in college. <laughs> um, and then I got funding, I got you know waves, packards, uh, as Mike said. And then I also got some funding and some um, labor from uh, UROC. And so J. Lo was the poor guy who had to take 8,000 images. Um, and then uh, John Freudel, who is here today, uh, who did a lot of dive work with me and was just a, a beast underwater. So um, that was great. Thank you, John. And uh, yep, and employment. I got a lot of jobs here, either through Mike or Kim Knoll or Jim Harvey or Joan and Katie from the library. And then overall, just the entire Moss Landing community is rad. Um, I've had a really good experience here. And the fact that like when I was making the artificial kelp, like it was crazy. Like I can't, like 30 people would show up per day. Um, students, some staff, I think some faculty at times, even the parents of a student came and helped. Like it was, it's crazy. And I really can't imagine that happening anywhere else. And with that, I'll take your question. I would go and do it right on the edge here. Um, are you talking about when I coupled them inside and out? Yes. Yep, so the water was always getting pushed this way. So I would do the first run in the bed, and then the die would be in there doing its thing. And then I could move it pretty far outside of the bed, um, and there would be no die because it was all getting pushed into shore. AC? She asked me a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, first of all, um, great amount of data. It's really impressive, and I really like the video that definitively proves fish are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the particular organic material, um, the lack of um, um, any kind of uh, effect from your treatment, um, shading effect. You removed kelp shading. Did you see any kind of response from the other story? I didn't know. Because I actually had a sinus surgery at some point. So I, I had to figure out how to sample everything by boat. Yep. So I, I occasionally would stick a GoPro in like a 20 foot long piece of PVC and scope around, but I wasn't really able to measure stuff that way. But in some sites, um, there was definitely no understory and some there were. That, I can at least say that much. Uh, the first part of your UDAS had a two millimeter filter. I was wondering if you could anecdotally talk about what that might have contributed to that you didn't see in your data? Mm -hmm. Well, I would have missed big chunks. But, um, I mean, I had to draw the line somewhere. I couldn't filter whole blades on fiber filters and stuff. But, um, yeah, if you were going to do it perfectly, you would do, um, I think you would 
capture all the stuff. So either by doing a settlement tube, what do you call those calling? Sediment trap? Yeah. Um, so like a, put down a big sediment trap or something and then just collect everything that's falling and then you could later then go break it up piece by piece and say how many big pieces, how many little pieces. And, but um, that might, I mean, there may have been some bigger pieces in my sites that I didn't collect, but I don't think that was the issue because I actually didn't have to clear out that filter very much. So most of the stuff was small, like really rarely did I get like a big blade chunk in there. Do you think that the, as a relationship you found between how important diet comes in there, do you think that's kind of fixed in general or could it vary? Because I was thinking, you know, the spring. Oh, I think it's super rare. You more diet comes, but that might also be one to help her. I've been losing a lot of sleep over this. Phytoplankton have been like, like the thing that have been driving me crazy um, this whole time. Uh, and now that I'm thinking about it, like in a bed this small, I'm actually more convinced now that phytoplankton are kind of like on a conveyor belt. Um, and so I think whatever's happening outside of the bed is just gonna get pushed through. So I definitely think like, yeah, when you have like a big bloom, um, I would expect there to be a huge spike, but. Um, I don't know if you would identify them or not, but did you, did you see them take diatoms in your? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the water getting pushed up. Did mm -hmm. you see that the diatoms getting pushed up inside of the bed? You know, I didn't actually classify them by depth. That would have been a good thing to do, but yeah, I didn't. I didn't do that. Anybody? <laughs> 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 yes, Mike. Um, but I think the easy one is, I think the easy one is, this was conducted in the fall. And as you know, there's a lot of seasonal phenology in the development in terms of when they shed particles and when they don't shed particles. Go out on a limb and tell us what it should, might have looked like it done in April. Yeah, I don't know. Well, are, are you saying that that's when you would expect more shedding to happen? I, I, well, you know, I'm thinking that. Because typically when I went to these sites in April, the bed wasn't filled in yet. And so I wanted to see when there was like the, the highest amount of kelp there. So usually I was there right until the storms ripped it out. Um, so I, I would actually expect the whole, like if you were looking at, yeah, I guess, I guess I would say that I think that you would start to see a reduction in overall organic matter when the beds aren't that thick. I'm thinking also the aspect of the spring bloom, mm -hmm. right? So if just just phytoplankton, for example, like everything else out there is beginning to build in spring. Might you be seeing different results as opposed to at the end of fall prior to the winter storms? It's completely different nutrient. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, ideally I would be able to do this throughout an entire year, but um, I just chose a snapshot of when would be most accessible and not have artificial kelp get ripped out. But So on top of that, uh, you're the first to put in um, physical structure, mm -hmm. right? But you're not the first to measure POC or, P or, or PON kelp beds. And there's, I know you're well aware of all those. Where do you compare, right? Where where your values, I mean, the ballpark of some of them are pretty broad. Yeah. Right? But, but where do they fit in relative to some of these people that came forward? Actually, really close. Um, so over, over Strom Coleman? I think that's how you say his name. Uh, he was a former Moss Landing student and did um, benthic POC in Stillwater Cove. And he had uh, a little less than what I got, but he was using a one millimeter filter and was sampling just above the bottom where my hoses were smacking into the, the floor. And he was actually lifting his up off a little ways. Um, so mine was a little higher than his, I think about twice as high as his. And then um, in Santa Barbara, I think of the, the paper, I, I want to say York 2013, but I'm not sure. But um, actually, my values were almost exactly to theirs. Um, and they just integrated through the water column. So. Yeah, I bet you can't do it again. <laughs>
You're right. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about the awesome forest we built. Thank you. Um, did you, what did you do to mimic the nematocysts? I can't remember how you figured out the buoyancy. Oh, the, the material was just buoyant. The, the tarp plus the, the yeah. polyethylene. Yep, yeah, actually by, for the stipe was really the, the part that was the buoyant force. And when I calculated down to like the Newtons, it was almost spot on. I was, I was stoked. I, I actually tried making nematocysts out of little packaging peanuts and, and folding them into each one and gluing it. And I got through like 100 and I was like, no. This is not happening. So my last question is a follow-up on that. Isn't that tell us what did you do with it? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Most of this was retrieved. Some was lost. And after retrieval, garbage. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to end your, your day on garbage. <laughs> um, we do have to take him away. His committee is going to take him into the room while the rest of you uh, lubricate and you're ready for an evening of celebration and another round of awesome students.